and thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Amanda. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, I'm just so excited to talk to you. I'm a big fan of Brilliant Inc. And we'll, we'll talk about your connection with that in a few minutes. Um, but I'm a big fan of your blog, the content you put out, the work you do. It's 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 like top tier communications work. And, and oh, I just love you. reading. Yeah, reading all the stuff you write um, on your blog. And, and I really want to start off talking about that, uh, the blog, because one of the themes I keep seeing throughout, and it's, it's something where it just isn't being talked about because there's all these other buzzwords, you know, employee experience and remote work. But you on your, your Brilliant Inc. blog, you mentioned company values quite a bit. I see it pop up often because values are foundational to how a company operates. Um, you're, yeah, you're a big proponent of keeping company values fresh. Why do you feel uh, keeping values fresh is so important? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, just as you said, values are so important. Um, you know, I think of them as something that's truly embedded in the company's DNA, right? It's, it's really like your ways of working, how you show up. And it, when it comes time to make really hard decisions, which we see a lot of companies making right now, it's the values that really guide how those decisions are made. And so really, when you stop and think about it, they shouldn't, your values shouldn't change that much. However, if your ways of working are evolving, or if there are major changes in leadership, or if there are changes in the business, maybe your company has acquired others and some of the things that you do have changed, then it is important to look at refreshing them. Typically, we see companies refresh their values every five to 10 years. Um, but what we really encourage is that companies should revisit their values intentionally at least once a year. Sit back, take a look at them, ask yourselves, you know, does this value represent where we are today? Does this value highlight what makes us different? Is it something that we do better than most other companies out there? Is it something that we expect people to demonstrate the moment that they walk in the door? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, then it's probably time to think about a refresh. So what would that look like, like an, for an internal communications person, right? For what role would they play um, in keeping that? Because I know a lot of times when I've worked at companies and it's generally driven by maybe the top down, um, like how would, how would I start or how would our listeners start that conversation? What does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely one of those areas that maybe communicators shy away from. They feel like it's not in their swim lane. Uh, but I really think that communicators are the right people to bring this up because for a few reasons. First of all, you have a finger on the pulse of your people. You understand what their challenges are, what their priorities are, what they're thinking about. Um, if you have to make that case to leadership that it's time for a refresh, it's a great opportunity to look around. What are your competitors doing? What are you saying? Could you make a case to leadership and say, hey, none of our competitors have refreshed their values in five years. I think it's time that we do. Let's go out and be leaders of the pack in that way um, and make that case. And the other thing that internal communicators are really good at is listening. And that is really the starting point when you are sitting down to refresh your values is to talk to your people, actually show them your values. When we do focus groups around values, we literally, let's put them up on the screen and say, does this resonate with you? How does this show up in your day-to-day -day experience? Do these words align with what you're living and breathing every day at this company? And if not, what would work? What might be here that we're not necessarily captured in these values? And so it's also a matter of uncovering some of those values that may already exist within your organization. And communicators are really good at doing that work. Yeah. So something that I've noticed when working in other places, when we've gone through a value refresh is, um, well, one of the things that I've noticed, let me put it that way, and maybe our listeners have as well, is that you could take 10 companies, right? And you could line company with their values right underneath them. And what you're going to see is that they're all very similar, almost even if you pick different industries, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. And so how, when, when we're working with leaders to refresh, how can we make sure our values stand out of the crowd? Yeah, it's a great question. There's actually some really interesting studies that have been done that have shown that so many companies list, for example, innovation as one yes. of the top values. And it's like, well, are you really, is that really core to who you are? Are you really like stand out at that if every other company in your industry and beyond has it? So one of the 
biggest ways to figure out if, uh, or to actually stand out, we say, is to sit down and think about what is truly core. So a lot of times I think leaders feel, and they fall into this very common trap that if I have core values, I need to have, they need to reflect everything. In other words, I care a lot about ethics. Of course, we have an ethical company. That doesn't mean that that has to be one of your core values. In fact, that may be something that is just like table stakes, right? You can't even work here if you don't believe in ethics. That's just basics. But a value is something that you do differently or better than almost everyone out there. And so really thinking about and drilling into what is core to who we are. And really, it shouldn't be more than like four to five. Brilliant Inc. has three values. So that to me is ideal. You want them to be differentiated. You want them to be real and core to who you are. And I mentioned Brilliant Inc. I mean, one of the other things is to really look at the language that you use in expressing your values. So for example, inclusion is something that's really important to us. And it is something that I think makes us different, but we don't use the word inclusion because that's a word that everyone uses, and it may mean something to one organization and different to another. So at Brilliant Inc., we say be human, and we talk more about what that means. That's language that's really fits us. And so it's both making sure you have the right core values and then that you're using the right words to express those core values. I feel like that's what stood out to me when I've worked in, on these types of initiatives is it's not just if you use that one where like innovation, it's like you can still, if that is your core value, it's more like a, a sentence that described it. We believe in you know something. So the values exactly. became more sentences, which honestly kind of felt I'm more connected to because you understood out of the get-go what they were saying. Exactly. And you, and you hit on another really important point too with that, which is that values on their own are not enough. You really have to continue to define not just the value, but what does it look like in practice? What are those actual specific behaviors? What do I mean by be human? And get very specific about it. It means I show up this way. It means I come to meetings with this mindset. It means... And really as much detail as you can drill into, into specific behaviors um, is super important. Otherwise values are pretty meaningless. Yeah. Is there a company that you think does this really well that stands out from the crowd? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think we spend a lot of time talking about companies that don't do it well, mm -hmm. um, especially with all the recent layoffs that have been happening and seeing how those have been handled by companies that, you know, claim to be very people first, and then they're doing their layoffs in a way that is very much not people first. Um, but I often talk about Patagonia as a shining example as a, of a company that has very strong, very clear values that reflect their day to day. Um, they refresh them in 2022. So they're not even they're, They don't sit on their laurels. They, they are looking at them and making sure they're, they're fresh. And so I really encourage um, people to check out Patagonia. Not only are they great values, but they truly show up in how they work um, and what they do day to day. Just giving, giving how the past, let's say 10 years has gone. We know three years ago, we really we really hit a different spot with the, with the pandemic and the social injustice in the com country and, and all sorts of stuff happened. Have you seen a shift in values over time and, and maybe even just like pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic or the way people are even talking about them at organizations? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's no question that this has become more important. Uh, and to some extent, I mean, we, we can kind of think of ourselves at Brilliant Inc. as our own little case study when we see, when we get a flood of calls and interest from companies about certain topics, that's when we kind of know, okay, here's a trend. And we have certainly seen a trend in the last five years or so of companies saying, we need help. We know this is important. We need to refresh our values. Uh, but there's so much research out there just showing and, and that, that values are much more important. And I think it's sort of for two reasons. One, you hit on, it's really the last three years, COVID, the global pandemic, the racial reckoning, all of these things have really combined to make workers rethink their experiences and really reprioritize, right, what's important to them. But it's also the generational changes uh, that are happening in the workplace. You know, we, we spent many, many years talking about millennials, and now we're talking about Gen Z. And, you know, really more than most generations that have preceded them, Gen Z workers really want meaningful and values aligned work. And so companies are realizing that if they want to be able to attract and retain 
the best young workers, they do really need to focus on this. And, you know, sure, maybe companies felt this was more important when the labor market was a little tighter. Um, but I would argue this is important no matter what's happening with the economy and no matter what's happening with the labor market, because in truth, looking at your values and how you express them does not have to be a terribly expensive and arduous undertaking. It's something that companies can do that really does make a difference. Um, that isn't necessarily a huge change in your you know, manufacturing processes. It's something that you can do without a huge, massive investment of time or energy. So the, the crux of this is you have the new values but the thing is, for me, is where the rubber meets the road, right? You can have these values, but how do we ensure that they're actually being sort of um, used to guide the business and, and serve as the foundation for the business? So when you work with leaders um, at a company, how are you instructing them to make sure that they're living the values and not just asking their employees to live the values? Like, you know, like maybe at their um, annual evaluation, they have to write how they how they demonstrated yes. each value. And then they have to go, oh, how did I do that? So how are you making sure, how are you making sure the company level, that high level, that it's, it's, it's happening at all levels? Yep. That's a, that's a great question. And it is absolutely crucial. And it goes back to what I said before, if it's just values, then you're doing it all wrong. And unfortunately, a lot of companies are even getting advice um, from other consultants that like, here are your values, go launch them. Here's do a campaign. And that is just completely wrong. It, there should not be a campaign to launch your values and then walk away. It's something that really does have to be baked into every component of the employee life cycle. So Brilliant Inc., we often talk about this employee life cycle. We have graphics of it that kind of show the key moments. And what we do when we're working with an organization is we'll sit down and actually audit their employee life cycle. Let's talk about each point in the life cycle from when you're hunting and hiring for new employees. How are your values showing up? How are your values showing up in the hiring process? Are you asking questions in interviews? Um, what about on day one? What about in onboarding? Um, and really making sure that we actually build a roadmap to ensure that it's showing up all the way along the employee life cycle. And I love the one that you mentioned, which is um, end of year reviews. You know, measuring and rewarding performance based on values is probably the most um, important and impactful way to make sure that your values are being lit. Because if you're not measuring people on it, then they're really not given any reason to care. Uh, but you also don't want them to get to that, you know, end of year review and think, well, how was I living that value? You want it to be something that they're thinking about on a regular basis. And that requires thoughtful planning. You can't just expect it to show up. You've got to have a roadmap and a plan to make it happen. Yeah. Let's back up a few minutes and talk just a little bit more about you. And I, I want to hear some stories you have. So we're going to move into our first segment, story time. Welcome to story time. Story time. Story time. Let me give you a story. When I was ta thinking about guests, because I get your blog, I was like, wow, I'd really like to have someone from um, Brilliant Ink here. And so I reached out to Carolyn Clark. Um, my, my boss. And I said, Hey, do you know anyone from Brilliant Ink? And she says, I know. And I was like, Ooh, this is a wish list item for me. <laughs> so I want to say so thank flattering. you for coming. Yes. Thank I, so thank you for being on here. You've been a Brilliant Ink for about 14 years. Can you tell us about what it is and what you do there? Sure, absolutely. So I've actually spent my entire career working in employee communications and engagement, and I've always worked on the outside, meaning I've never actually sat in-house and run a function. I've always been at consultancies or agencies that focus on this area. Um, and so in that time, I've seen lots of different ways of doing that. And so the way that we do it at Berlin Inc. has sort of been my vision, which is that we are a hybrid of strategic consulting and creative. So what that means is that um, we work with companies exclusively on employee communications. It's all that we do. And we really take both sides of that equation. We can be strategic partners. We can help them define communication strategies that are appropriate for the organizational changes that they're facing. We have deep research expertise. We have the ability to build channels and measure and um, you know, ensure constant improvement. That's all really strategic consultative work. But the other part is that, of it is that we want to be able to help our clients actually 
make the changes. So we also are a full service creative agency. So that means we can bring all that strategy stuff to life through writing, through design, branding, video, photo, all the kind of fun stuff um, that people think about. Because I, I think in looking at um, the landscape, there are a lot of companies that do one or the other really well. And I really wanted to be able to support those in-house folks that, that have a job that is frankly much, much harder than mine um, to be able to give them everything that they need and not say, okay, we can get you this far and then you're going to need to find someone else to take you the rest of the way. Yeah. And, and so what is your role there at Brilliant Inc.? So I'm, I'm the CEO in addition to being the full owner. So we're proud to be a, a woman owned business. Um, and I run the company, uh, which means I do a lot of, you know, marketing like this, thought leadership, speaking at conferences, but it's also really important to me to continue working with clients. I love um, doing that work. I was an employee of Brilliant Inc. long before I was the owner of Brilliant Inc. And so I love being able to continue to be in the trenches with my clients, talk to them about the challenges they're facing, um, see what's working. Um, but it's also really probably the most important thing to me and the deepest uh, part of my passion for my work is running a company um, with an amazing employee experience ourselves. You know, we, I, I really feel like if we're going to go out and advise companies on how to have a great employee experience for their people, I need to offer one to my people. And so that has been really important to me that we are living up to our own promises internally in terms of, you know, benefits, flexibility, inclusion, diversity, all the things that are so important to building a great organization, I've really tried to do within Brilliant Inc. as well. I do want to let our listeners know that uh, you may get, if you're, you know, if you're one of those people like me who get a million newsletters and like, uh, you know, you have this webinar and this webinar from all these different organizations, Brilliant Inc. is the one that I actually am like, oh, can't wait to read it. And I'll, and I'll open it and then I'll, you know, save it and I'll, you know, go throughout a day and read it. So I find so there's so much value in, in you know, the blog you put out um, oh, that I, I just want to let our listeners know it's worth signing up for. Is there a moment in your career, you said, you know, you always an agency, maybe even, you know, college or, or where, whenever, when you said you wanted to change the employee experience or work at employee communications. I mean, I, I started external communications, ended up rebuilding a website. And I was like, well, I'm at it. I'll add, I'll make an intranet for all the employees, which I didn't realize how hard that was going to be. But then once it was done, I was like, wow, I really like this more internal focused stuff. So that was for me where I changed. But I'm wondering for you, because your experience is a little different. Um, is there a moment when you're like this, this is what I want to do? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I graduated from college in the year 2000, which was a really great year. Uh, the market was like, there were just a whole slew of job opportunities for people coming out of college. And I studied public relations and I I was interested in it, but I also was really interested in consulting. Um, I had a policy studies major as well. And I was sort of like, is there something out there that allows me to do both? Um, and the other piece of it is as I started researching and realizing that there is sort of this area of change management, employee engagement, while that really leans heavily on the communication strategies that I studied in college, but even more than that is that we've all had employee experiences at some point. I was even at age, you know, the, the very naive age of 22, I had worked at probably seven or eight jobs at that point, right, throughout high school and college. So in every one of those, you can relate to what it's like to be an employee. Mm -hmm. You can relate to how every, you know, if you show up on the first day, is there someone to even show you how to log into your computer? you can understand the concept of an employee experience. And so that is what really motivated me was like, wow, the ability to change what people experience day to day at their work felt so important to me. I mean, look how much time we spend working um, in our lives, right? It's like the majority of how we spend our time, um, hopefully not the majority, but a big portion of how we yeah. spend our time day to day and the ability to influence that was really appealing to me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to move into our next segment, Getting Tactical. I'm trying to figure out tactics. 
One of the topics that's most near and dear to my heart um, that I know that I also read a lot through your newsletter and on your blog at Brilliant Inc. is this deskless frontline employee experience. Now, I just had someone on and we talked about this as being on screen versus hands on. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of like those terms as well. Uh, but for the sake of this, we'll just say um, we'll call them hands on, right? People who don't work at a screen all day. Mm -hmm. um, I worked at a, in a position where I had, where I, that was a big, that was 85% of the population at work. And boy, I tell you, that was, that was challenging. You know, you try every which way. So that's why this yeah, is near and dear to my, my, my heart. Um, so I want to talk about that for a few minutes, because that's such a great topic. Is there, I, I think this seems obvious, but can we talk a little bit about how that experience differs for them? And so if you, if you're one of those people who don't have never worked with those hands-on deskless employees, can you just help people understand that experience and why it's so challenging? Sure. Absolutely. And, and this goes back to even what I was saying before, we can all maybe think back to our early working years. I actually have a 15-year-old who is off at his very first paying job right now as a counselor oh. in training at a, at a summer camp. And there you go. He's a deskless worker, right? My very first job was working in a retail store. Um, then I was a hostess at a restaurant, a um, desk uh, assistant at a, at a vet's office. So I, throughout my career and probably throughout yours and most listeners here, have at some point had some sort of paying work that they can think of that's different from what they might be doing now, right? Where it wasn't most of your day spent sitting at a desk, either on the phone or on a computer, right? And really try to put yourself into those shoes, into that position, right? My son got his first paycheck. He had questions about it. Who does he ask? How does he get in touch with that person? He's more likely to go up and walk up to them and ask them the next time he sees them. And it's his immediate boss. He's not going to HR. He's not going to the CEO, right? So it's it's really putting yourselves into their shoes and thinking this is different. Um, and, you know, think about somebody who is driving in a car for most of their job or and how are they getting information or think about somebody that's working in a hospital for most of their job? What are their touch points? Where would they go if they had a question? Where would they go if they need information? And so, so much of it is just really trying to take ourselves out of our day-to-day -day experience, which is, feels so normal to us, right? It's hard to imagine, but it's not hard to find uh, the people around you that work in a very different way and try to think about how their experiences are different. Yeah. And that, that's one of the things that struck me when I, when I had my experience with, you know, those more hands-on deskless screenless folks is that, um, you know, I, I'd have to remind myself that while I'm building this newsletter, you know, it'll take them five minutes to read it. But when you're working, you know, you're doing something with your hands and you're kind of physically sort of exhausting yourself, probably the last thing you want to do is get on your phone and yeah. read bunch of emails and then a newsletter and then go to the intranet. Like we have to be real with ourselves when thinking about their experience. Absolutely. And not only that, we have to be real when we're thinking about you sent that newsletter, but what did their manager send them and what did their division leader send them and what did their facilities person send them and think about all the different. Right. And so one of the things that we often do is like a day in the life. Let's think about what does that person's day look like? not only considering what I as the internal comms person want to get to them, but all the things they get. And by putting yourself in their shoes too, you might recognize like, huh, their day actually starts with a commute in the car. Is there something I could do with that? Or when they get there, they have to clock in on their app on their phone. Is there something I can do with that? Or every morning they have a huddle before they do rounds? Is there something I can do with that? So really that day, to, day in the life exercise could be super helpful. Yeah. I think all of that sort of context switching for them, you know, from my experience mm -hmm. leads to more, you know, a lot of just not able to be able to be reached in the ways that internal communicators would want, right? Exactly. There's, and it causes a lot of burnout. But can you talk about like why you think that deskless, hands-on employee, is it a higher risk for turnover and burnout? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I think about it, 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 it's actually something that's really, it's, it's emotional. If you, if you sit and think about it, I mean, first of all, deskless workers are the vast majority of workers out there. It's something like in the billions, almost 3 billion deskless workers um, in the world. And they are at, there's some studies that show something like a third have intention to leave their job in the next six months. And that is like, that represents a hundred million people. Like that's mm-hmm. just vast, vast numbers. And part of the reasons why are, you know, they're often forgotten and overlooked. Deskless workers, not always. I, I hate to make generalizations because yeah. Doctors are deskless, just like factory workers, and the experiences that they have are vastly different. But if you do think specifically about areas like manufacturing um, or like service, you know, any type of service type industry where there's delivery or retail, those jobs tend to be hourly. They tend to receive lower wages um, and they tend to the communications to those audiences tend to be very tactical and um, production focused. Right. I'm going to tell you. Um, how you're doing against producing, you know, this number of widgets per day, how many safety incidents there have been and how many, you know, late check-ins there have been, things like that. Well, what about the meaning behind the work that I'm doing? Am I, is my work impacting a patient somewhere? Is my work impacting the company in some significant way? The answer is very likely yes, but it's often overlooked. Um, And I think the other big piece of this that for me is really sad is that these same workers were the ones that throughout COVID didn't start working remote, right? Whether you are, again, talking about all the first responders and healthcare workers that were just expected to work straight through COVID and we were relying on them to work and people in labs developing treatments, they were all essential workers, but also I mean, I lived in, I live in New York City. I had people delivering my groceries, delivering my food. I wasn't allowed to go to the stores. Um, and those people were expected to work and yet were not given anything in terms of a raise or a better experience. Um, and so it's really not a surprise that, that burnout um, is happening in such large volumes among these populations. How can, so if, if for our listeners, like if you're sitting out there and you know that this is an issue, is there something companies can do to help with that burnover that leads to turnout or turnover, yep. burnout that leads to turnover? Burnout leads to turnover. And it, and that's really the, I think that's really what it comes down to. I mean, look, we have to be able to make the business case. And I think those numbers alone, there's plenty of data out there to make that business case. The risk of our company losing a third of our deskless workers. Can you imagine the cost of that, the replacement costs? I mean, look, I like to look at things through a human lens, but if you're trying to appeal to leadership, let's get specific with some numbers and financial risks um, that are involved. And really, I think it's it, that communicators have a responsibility to elevate this in importance, to bring it to leaders. And, and again, it doesn't have to be a huge change. This doesn't have to be a huge expensive lift to be to, to make sure that we're focusing on these employees' experiences. Let's sit down and talk to them. Let's understand what do they want. Most often, one of the research shows that uh, deskless workers really want more in terms of learning and development. So, and maybe you're already offering those things and you actually don't even have to spend any additional money, but you need to make more of an effort to ensure that they understand the learning and development opportunities available to them, that they're taking advantage of them, that people who are managing deskless workers are maybe getting that special training or additional resources and tools to make sure they're equipped to create a great experience for their people. So really, I just want to motivate and inspire communicators to bring this to leadership, to make sure that deskless workers are sort of brought into the light, that they are focused on as a specific audience, um, and that you know there are communication strategies tailored for them. It's not hard. It's not expensive. It can really pay off. Let's talk about some of those sort of best ways to strategies to best engage with hands hands on deskless off screen workers. Um, I have my own thoughts just based on what I've done, but I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I mentioned one of them already, but managers. Um, yeah. That is really, I would say, I, I, you know, I don't often say it should always be this. I don't make a lot of like always statements as a consultant, right? Classic consultant answers like it depends. But when it comes to those hands-on workers, managers are 
always the number one best most important way to reach them um, because it's exactly like I said, my son gets a paycheck. Who's he going to go ask? He's going to go to his manager. That's who he sees. Exactly. That's who leads the morning huddles. That's who's there in the break room. Um, that, that's the person. And so making sure that managers are equipped, giving them the tools and resources that they need and also holding them accountable. Let's make sure we're measuring our managers on their ability to communicate effectively and then asking their direct reports for that feedback. Back. So managers is a big one. Um, another really big one that seems kind of obvious when we think about it, but a lot of companies overlook is physical space and the use of physical space to reach those deskless workers. And I mentioned, you know, look, there might be screens that say our safety stats or our production stats, but how about using those screens for other things like spotlighting different employees that are doing great work or that have um are demonstrating values aligned behaviors um, or um, reminding people the impact of the work that we're doing, showing patient stories, um, things like that. So using those screens or that even that physical space to bring some of those important messages to those deskless workers is another really important consideration. Let's move on because there's a couple more topics I want to cover today. Sure. Um, another topic that I see in your your blog newsletter regularly is DE and I and that's such an important topic that's been discussed pretty widely especially more over the past few years Absolutely. I want to start there so let's talk about DE and I so tell, can you first start off let's let's take a step back and help our listeners understand how language factors into inclusivity uh, when it comes to communications yeah absolutely I mean look Diversity, equity, inclusion, it feels scary to communicators. It feels like, oh, this is, I'm not an expert in this. I, I didn't study diversity. I don't know. I don't know what to do. So let's just put that aside and, and exactly what you said, language, okay? Language, we're, we're communicators, right? We can all understand the power of words, the power of the things that we say. And the fact of the matter is, the total sum of your communications as an organization sends messages about what you think about inclusivity, right? Right off the bat, do you include pronouns? Um, if you introduce yourself with pronouns, you're sending a subtle message that, hey, this is something that we think about and everyone is welcome here and you show up how you want to show up and we're going to respect that. We're not going to make any assumptions. Small messages can be sent through the ways that you communicate, the words that you choose to use. Um, and it can't be accidental. It does have to be intentional. So that's a good starting point for internal comms people is let's, let's hone in on the language piece and really thinking about how we can make our language, the words that we use more inclusive. You know, when I, uh, I used to partner really closely in one of my previous jobs with the DE&I group, and like once once a year, we, they'd get together with all the internal communicators and sort of talk about the language that we were using. And, and this wasn't a, you're using this wrong finger wagging. It was like, hey, the narrative has shifted. We'd like for you all to start you know, saying this or not saying this. And we're like, thank you. And then we'd all be grateful and we move on. And then we do, we'd keep doing it to make sure that yes. we were, you know, being mindful. No one is being malicious. Um, in that way, but I, I want to, we set that fear aside, but I want to bring it back really quickly. Um, so why do you think, what do you think that fear is based in? Um, what do you think they feel apprehensive of when it comes to that de and I? There is definitely this sense that there is a, there's a right and a wrong way to do things. And yes, to some extent there is, but it's exactly what you just said, Amanda. It's always changing. It's always shifting. We can say right now, we don't say the word slave, we say enslaved people. But you know what, in another five or 10 years, the, the thinking around that may evolve even further. So I love the example that you shared uh, from a past job where you got back together regularly and really remembering that there is no set in stone right or wrong way to do things. That right away can get rid of um, a lot of your concern and worry um, by just recognizing that there is no right or wrong way to do it, that it is an ongoing dialogue. For example, we have a, a inclusive language guide on our website, Say This, Not That is the title. But guess what? Our, our 
expert, our in-house expert on diversity, equity, inclusion is regularly updating that because it's got to be refreshed. Sensibilities are changing. What's acceptable is changing. And while it is risky to talk and speak on this topic, it's so much more important to take some chances. You know, a lot of times when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, communicators have their heart in the right place. They want to move the needle. They want to make a difference. Um, but the fear and apprehension can cause you to sit still. And so what I often say to people is focus on just moving the needle a little bit, just nudging the needle forward just a little bit. Because if in every communication you do, you're able to just make things one or 2% better over time, that is going to make a difference. And think about those small incremental changes versus like we have to go out there and pronounce our commitment to social justice and you know all of these things it doesn't have to be so big it can be small incremental changes sometimes that helps people get past that fear absolutely something is better than nothing uh, exactly. for sure when it comes to this yeah exactly. when so we just had this long conversation about that hands-on off-screen employee that front list frontline desk list so I want to I want to mend these two together because this isn't something I feel like I, I've heard a lot about um, or read a lot about. So, what are some inclusion considerations uh, we need to account for when it comes to that hands-on, deskless, screenless population? Yeah, I mean, it's really it's no different than if you're thinking about your overall population. It is about really getting into their day to day and understanding um, what is important to them. What are those topics that matter most? What are the channels that are most effective? And the best way to do that is to talk to them um, through focus groups and through surveys. Um, when it comes to maybe targeting um, or thinking about making sure you're communicating um, appropriately with a different type of audience. Maybe you want to make sure that you're reaching out specifically to your Black population. Then you might engage your ERG, right, your employee resource group, and talk to them. Um, in the case of deskless workers, it's the same thing. You want to make sure that you're sitting down and talking with them. Um, focus groups can sometimes be hard with a deskless workforce, right? You might not be able to just pull a bunch of people off the line or pull a bunch of doctors out during rounds. And so sometimes we'll say, all right, you know what, let's do two to three people at a time, set up a, a, you know, a laptop to take notes in the break room and call a couple people in at a time and talk to them about what's working, what's not working, what do you need? Uh, because inclusion is really about understanding the unique experiences of people at work and making sure that we're considering those experiences in the way that we communicate. And that's that's really what it comes down to. Are there any other do's or don'ts of a good DEI communication strategy that we haven't covered that you would you can share? I think that the, you know, Really, it's around research. There, there, there is no um, one way of doing things. And so that's why we always focus on the need to talk to employees. Um, and so definitely focus groups are a great one, um, but surveys are also really important. That's another really great way to check your progress, right? Focus groups are something that you might only have the opportunity to do once a year, but a survey is something you can do to check in um, every quarter to pulse um, and really make sure that things are uh, moving in the direction that you want them to. And we talk about that a lot on our blog. Um, but also it's, it's about digging deep into the data that you find, right? You may find, for example, that you have um, a lot of women in your C-suite. Great. We have two women out of the five people on our, our executive team. But let's take a look closer. What roles are those women in? Are they in roles that really can make a difference, um, that are change maker type roles? Are they running something like operations or finance? Um, or are they in something that is less of a change maker role? So really digging into results and making sure that they're not just changes on the surface, but are changes that are getting at the things that you truly want to accomplish and are truly going to make a difference. Let's move into our last segment, asking for our friend. Hey, asking for a friend. Hey, asking for a friend. <laughs> on, the, on the blog, there's an, uh, a fairly recent blog published titled, Why Most Companies Should Not Publicly Celebrate History, Heritage, and Awareness Months. 
Whew. And I read that uh, when I saw that title, I was like, I've got to go into this one. So can you just t- sort of discuss, can you, would you just discuss uh, the crux of that? Like what, what the meaning is and what companies are doing wrong uh, when they celebrate these awareness months? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of similar to, um, I've talked a lot about research and you can tell I'm passionate about it. And it's similar to one of the things that I say about research, which is don't ask the question unless you're ready to actually act on it because nothing makes people more angry than being asked their opinion on something, them sharing and nothing being done. You're better not asking at all. And it's very similar when it comes to DE and I, right? You should actually say nothing as a company than say something that is empty and it's not backed up with actions. One of the ways that we at Brilliant Inc. determine whether or not we're going to make some sort of public statement about something is can we actually back it up with action? Are we actually going to back it up with action? And if not, we're not going to say anything because, you know, employees don't need to hear thoughts and prayers. They actually want action. And so unless a company is actually doing something, they shouldn't be out there talking about it. Unless, and and we can see that there've been so many examples. One one of the ones that comes to mind is um, recently with Budweiser and some of the um, communications that they have done. And I encourage if people haven't um, read or seen some of the um, controversy around that to do some research, um, you could probably Google search Budweiser trans community and see some of the ways that they have gone out and made bold statements and then walked those back. And the impact of that is so much worse than if they had said nothing at all. And so again, it's like silence is better than empty words without action. That's really what it comes down to. Do not offend your people by putting a flag over your logo if you're not actually going to back that up in your actions and decisions. Absolutely. I've, I, this just hit me. How many, how many employees are there at Brilliant Inc? Brilliant Inc today is about 15 employees. Um, and then we have sort of a flexible team of experts that ranges from about 15 to 20 people that come in and out on different projects. Okay. I was, I was going to ask if you want, well, and maybe I could still ask if you have somebody there who does employ communications. Oh, that's I, what a I would really call good one question. Of the, yeah. At one of the top employee communications firms, I would be so nervous if I was doing it. And I've, I've been in the business for 16, 17 years. I would be just handshaking, hitting the send button. Yep. So would you just tell us a little bit about that? Oh, that resonates, Amanda. That resonates. Like I said, the bar is very high. You know, they, they, they always say the cobbler's children have no shoes. And it's yeah. really important to make sure to me that doesn't happen. Um, but it is hard. Look, for a long time, we didn't have an intranet. We're a small company. What does a small company need an intranet for? But, oh, by the way, we do need one, right? We do need to have a central place where people can see our values and our company holidays and our, you know, who to contact for different things. So, So um, it is something that actually the entire leadership team owns. Um, It's something that we look at constantly. We do have somebody that uh, oversees our people operations and is constantly making sure that we are keeping our commitments, that we're walking the walk. Um, So yes, we do. We we actually have multiple people that look after employee communications at Brilliant Inc. starting with me, yours truly. (laughs) It must be pretty amazing. So <laughs> that's pretty. Well, it's that's not funny. easy. It's it's not easy. Yeah. It's it's not easy. Yeah. but it's important. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, you're one of the top internal comms influencers that I, I mean that I know of uh, for sure. So I'm just wondering if you could give us like a preview or, or anything you think of any trends that we need to stay on top of and be prepared for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think um, no one is having a conversation right now about trends in communications and not talking about AI. Uh, There is definitely a place to talk about AI. It's super important. Um, There are a lot of places out there talking about it, including Brilliant Inc. Um, I try to play with chat GPT or some other AI tool at least once a day, um, just so that I myself can understand it. I think when people don't know it or understand it, they're much more likely to be scared. And I'm hearing on one end of the spectrum, oh, it's never gonna affect us. And on the other end, oh, our jobs are gonna be obsolete in five years. I don't actually think it's either one of those. I think it's somewhere in the middle. And so I just really encourage people to um, be aware. Don't be fearful. Don't be um, 
don't completely brush it off, but just be aware, read about what's happening, play with the tools, make sure you're experimenting with them, um, but also make sure that you're aware of the risks that come along with them. There are plenty of inclusion risks um, that come along with using AI, and there are also risks around safety and privacy. We work with client inf sensitive client information, and so our people cannot use ChatGPT um, for any client work that's going to you know, breach any of our agreements with clients but we can certainly use it in other ways that are safe. And so just really getting in there, I think is, is super important um, and understanding it. And then it's really the other things that we've discussed. Values, I think, will continue to be so important. And it's something that I really want communicators to play a role in. It's something that can make a big difference in the life and health of a business. And we are well suited to play a role in that, um, as well as shedding light on populations that maybe are overlooked in traditional communication strategies, whether that's your deskless workers, whether it's your younger workers or your older workers, um, you know, but really honing in on those audiences that might be forgotten in day-to-day -day communications efforts. And this is, this was a bucket list level, uh, podcast for me. So this has been, and it's been just a lot of fun. Uh, oh, I wish too. we could talk forever and, and I, I, you know, I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire on this, but I'd love to have you back. Maybe even next year we can come back and and talk about new trends and, yes. and other topics I'd love it. as well. I'd love it. Let's do it. Oh, fan. Okay, fantastic. Um, before I let you go, let our listeners yeah. know where they can find you. Sure, absolutely. So our website is brilliantink.com and that's ink, I-N-K, um, because we love to write. Um, and our website has lots of resources, our blog. Um, we also have resource centers there. So on different topics, um, we gather a lot of resources, whether it's diversity and inclusion. Um, we had one around return to work, things like that. And then of course, our monthly newsletter, The Inkwell, which you mentioned, um, which we pull together lots of great different resources. Um, we are currently on a break from Twitter, um, but you can follow me on LinkedIn and Mellinger or Brilliant Inc. Um, as well as all the members of the Brilliant Inc. team are always sharing their own brilliance um, on LinkedIn as well. Yeah. And I, I can't recommend enough for our listeners to go out and subscribe to the blog or subscribe to the newsletter and check the blog. I think I go in about once a month and just sort of look and see if there's anything I haven't read. Well, thanks so much, Amanda. We appreciate it. Yeah. I, oh, anytime. I'm one of your biggest, biggest cheerleaders over here. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. And this has been just great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Amanda. And keep doing the great work of um, educating and informing communicators. It's what we all love to do and it's what we're all here to do together. So I appreciate you as well. Thank you. I, I, I really, really appreciate you saying that. A lot, a lot of appreciation going on today. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thanks, Anne. Thank you.